Welcome to Sunday Talk. Today will be an intermission lesson coming from Matthew 5, 1 through 22. And I know in the last lesson I said it was verses 1 through 21. That was a typo. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and discuss being content in the kingdom of God. The right to be in a good attitude. The overview of the lesson is going to be the scripture as we generally do. To keep in mind our aim for change. We'll discuss the Sermon on the Mount. We'll also go into salt, specifically looking at rock salt, which is called halite, as well as we'll discuss light and lasers. And we'll go briefly over these topics. And then we'll summarize as we generally do. Our scripture for today is coming from Matthew 5, 1 through 22, English Standard Version. Matthew 5, 1 through 22, ESV, and it reads as follows. Seeing the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You are the salt of the earth, but if salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand. And it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others, so that they may see your good works, and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. You have heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says, You fool! will be liable to the hell fire or the hell of fire bless the reading of the word is in your son jesus christ's name we do pray all of this and more amen our keep in mind is coming from matthew 5 13 through 16 esv and it reads as follows you are the salt of the earth but if salt has lost its taste how shall its saltiness be restored it is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Blessed is the reading of the word. It's in your Son, Jesus Christ's name. We do pray all of this and more. Amen. Our aim for change for this lesson is... How to make the Sermon on the Mount, the Beatitudes specifically, become a normal occurrence in our life. 
It is dependent on the way the message is received and how it is reforming the life of the individual. It is receiving the blessing that occurs in every stage of life and every class of living. How to make sure that saltiness does not lose its taste. It is important to look into the taste of salt and its utilization within society to cure and improve the taste in everyday living. Without it, no innovations may have occurred, not just in the physical, but spiritual. Lastly, how to become the light of the earth, a city on the hill. It is seen that light shines best in darkness. It is through being a good citizen the light will shine through the good works that are done in our homes, neighborhoods, schools, and overall community. It beacons the knowledge that has been given from God as the Father of lights. And you can read James 1, 17 through 20 for that. Now we're going to discuss the Sermon on the Mount. And for this portion, I'm going to read it verbatim. And for the following portions on the Sermon on the Mount, I'm not necessarily going to read it completely verbatim. I'm going to discuss certain parts of it that seem to be more important to capture, especially for this part. And as we move forward, there will be other intermission lessons like this one. So we're going to pull from these chapters that are about the Sermon on the Mount in later intermission lessons, in addition to John 17. And I'm hoping that you're looking forward to that as much as I am. So right now we're going to dive into the Sermon on the Mount, reading this one verbatim. And then, of course, as general, you can pause the talk anytime. And plus, I'm going to give you time to read it after this. So I'm going to go ahead and read it, give you your time to read it, and you can pause the talk at any point in time to read it yourself. Okay, the Sermon on the Mount, anglicized from the Matthew Vulgate Latin section titled Sermon in Monte, is a collection of sayings and teachings attributed to Jesus Christ, which emphasizes his moral teaching found in the Gospel of Matthew, chapters 5, 6, and 7. It is the first of the five discourses of Matthew, and it takes place relatively early in the ministry of Jesus, after he has been baptized by John the Baptist, finished his fasting and spiritual retreat in the desert, and begun to preach in Galilee. The name and location of the mountain is unstated. The mountain of Beatitudes, a hill on the shore of Lake Galilee, is the traditional interpretation. The sermon is the longest continuous discourse of Jesus found in the New Testament and has been one of the most widely quoted elements of the canonical Gospels. It includes some of the best known teachings of Jesus such as the Beatitudes and the widely recited Lord's Prayer. The Sermon on the Mount is generally considered to contain the central tenets of Christian discipleship. The Sermon on the Mount occupies chapters 5, 6, and 7 of the Gospel of Matthew. The sermon has been one of the most widely quoted elements of the canonical Gospels. This is the first of the five discourses of Matthew, the other four being Matthew 10, Matthew 13, verses 1 through 53, Matthew 18, and the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24. The sermon is set early in the ministry of Jesus after he has been baptized by John the Baptist in chapter 3 of the Gospel of Matthew, gathered his first disciples in chapter 4, and had returned from a long fast in contemplation in the Judean desert where he had been tempted by Satan to renounce his spiritual mission and gain worldly riches. Before this episode, Jesus had been all about Galilee, preaching as in Matthew 4.23, and great crowds followed him from all around the area. The setting for the sermon is given in Matthew 5.1-2. Jesus sees the multitudes, goes up into the mountain, is followed by his disciples, and begins to preach. The sermon is brought to its close by Matthew 8, 1, 
which reports that Jesus came down from the mountain, followed by great multitudes. So we will continue on and discuss the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, we'll select certain portions from this detail about the Sermon on the Mount. But I'm going to give you a portion of time to read this for yourself. And if you pause this talk and kind of discuss this for yourself to actually read it over, that's great. But again, you have this additional time, and that time starts right now. Now we're going to start as some people call cherry pick the details about the Sermon on the Mount. I'm going to go ahead and start with the second bullet and read all the way down until the first bullet of the second half of this detail right in front of you about the Sermon on the Mount. So we're going to start reading where it says Matthew 5, 3 through 12. And we'll continue on the way down until we discuss uh, hell fire. And I'm going to give you that time to also read the whole detail for yourself and kind of analyze uh, some specific points in here. There's also some great stuff going into uh, Matthew 6 and Matthew 7. But I primarily want to focus in on what's being discussed and what is going to be highlighted within this talk uh, about the salt and the light. So I'm putting emphasis on that. But I'm going to give you the freedom to actually read some of this on your own. Of course, at the end. And of course, you have the time to pause the talk at any point in time. So even now. So I'm going to go ahead and read Matthew 5. 3 through 12, starting there, and then going all the way until it says hellfire. And it reads as follows. Matthew 5, 3 through 12 discusses the Beatitudes. These describe the character of the people of the kingdom of heaven, expressed as blessings. The Greek word most versions of the gospel render as blessed can also be translated happy. Matthew 5, 3 through 12, in Young's literal translation, for example. In Matthew, there are eight or nine blessings, while in Luke, there are four, followed by four woes. In almost all cases, the phrases used in the Beatitudes are familiar from an Old Testament context, but in the sermon, Jesus gives them new meaning. Together, the Beatitudes present a new set of ideals that focus on love and humility rather than force and mastery. They echo the highest ideals of Jesus' teaching on spirituality and compassion. In Christian teachings, the works of mercy which have corporal and spiritual components, have resonated with the theme of the Beatitudes from Mercy. These teachings emphasize that these acts of mercy provide both temporal and spiritual benefits. Matthew 5, 13-16 presents the metaphors of salt and light. This completes the profile of God's people presented in the Beatitudes and acts as the introduction to the next section. There are two parts in this section using the terms salt of the earth and light of the world to refer to the disciples, implying their value. Elsewhere in John 8:12, Jesus applies light of the world to himself. Jesus preaches about hell and what hell is like. But I say unto you that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment and whoever shall say to his brother raka fool shall be in danger of the council but whosoever shall say thou fool shall be in danger of hell's fire and i'm gonna just read this one more time the the scripture that it's pulling from 
But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, fool, shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hell fire. And I want to make sure that comes out clear to you um, as much as possible. Again, I'm going to give you the time to read this whole detail for yourself. We'll move on to continue with the rest of the information about the Sermon on the Mount. But right now, I'm going to give you that time. And that time starts now. Now we're going to continue and conclude our discussion of the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, we're going to start reading from the second bullet, going all the way to the fourth bullet, and we're going to read into righteousness or way of life. We'll also discuss the high ethical standards of the sermon and the way that's interpreted by different Christian groups. I'm just going to briefly list those out to you. And, of course, you have the time to read this on your own at the end. Also, you can pause the talk at any point in time during the time of this discussion. But let's begin to look at this portion here. Starting at the second bullet and reading on down to the fourth bullet where it says, At the end, righteousness or way of life. We'll begin there. And it reads as follows. The last verse of chapter 5 of Matthew, Matthew 5:48 is a focal point of the sermon that summarizes its teaching by advising the disciples to seek perfection. The Greek word teleos used to refer to perfection also implies an end or destination, advising the disciples to seek the path towards perfection and the kingdom of God. It teaches that God's children are those who act like God. The teachings of the sermon are often referred to as the ethics of the kingdom. They place a high level of emphasis on purity of the heart and embody the basic standard of Christian righteousness. The theological structure of the Sermon on the Mount is widely discussed. One group of theologians ranging from St. Augustine in the 5th century to Michael Golder in the 20th century, see the Beatitudes as the central element of the sermon. Others, such as Gunther Borkman, or Borkim, see the sermon arranged around the Lord's Prayer, while Daniel Pate, or Daniel Pat, closely followed by Ulrich Luz, see a chiastic structure. In the sermon, Dale Allison and Glenn Stassen have proposed a structure based on triads. Jack Kingsbury and Hans Dieter Betts see the sermon as composed of theological themes, e.g. righteousness or way of life. And going back into the chiastic structure, we discussed that slightly within the discussion of Daniel. So going back through uh, those discussions, uh, remembering the chiasmus that's found, I believe, in chapter 4 of Daniel and the structure there, and also, I believe, looking into chapter 6 there also, if I'm not mistaken. But if not so, we'll go back to Daniel 4 and look at that and understand what the chiastic structure is based on within this sermon and understand that this is implied within these chapters from uh, chapter 5 all the way until its end point at chapter 8 verse 1. Now let's look at the different views uh, that are seen about the high ethical standards from these different Christian groups. The first one is the predominant medieval view 
reserving a higher ethic for clergy, especially in monastic orders. The second is a view associated with Martin Luther that it represents an impossible demand but serves to educate Christians on the ideals of their faith. The third is the Anabaptist, a literal view which directly applies the teachings. Four is the social gospel view. Fifth is the Christian extensionalism view. Six is the Sir Richard's view of an imminent eschatology referring to an interim ethic. Seventh is the dispens dispensational excuse me, eschatology which refers to to the future kingdom of God, and then eight is the inaugurated eschatology in which the sermon's ethics remain a goal to be approached, yet realized. So that's a lot going on, especially when we're talking about the eschatologies with the last three. Um, I see that people would possibly want me to exclaim a certain view. I don't understand the views primarily too well, but it seems like the presentation that was first introduced seems to come from that social gospel view and then everything else following along with maybe a literal view or a view with Martin Luther could be found later on and or with the predominant medieval view based on the way things are going to be structured within Daniel and how that was presented to you. I'm not really sure but I'm understanding that dispensational eschatology is somewhat of a hope for people so the seventh view is somewhat something that I'm hoping to see in reality in application here on earth something that's physical something that's real something that's real to me I can actually do it here and that takes time and that takes practice but I believe that's the total call of the Sermon on the Mount to bring that ethics out of people and to apply this not only in congregation but in your vocation and making sure that you can apply that to your neighbor and to those that you work with. I'm going to give you the time now to actually read over all of this for yourself and I'm going to let you absorb all of this in and excuse me for not reading everything so clearly, but I'm hoping that you got something out of this one right here. And that your time starts right now. Now we're going to go over the definition of salt and rock salt. We're going to go over some basic information of salt first, and then we're going to go over some basic information of rock salt later. But you also have the option of pausing the talk at any point in time between these two and or waiting until the end to read it for yourself for each of these. Again, you have the option to pause the talk at any point in time between these two descriptions of salt and rock salt. And or you can wait until the end to read it for yourself aloud or in silence, whichever you prefer. I'm going to go ahead and read the description for salt first, and it reads as follows. Salt is a mineral composed primarily of sodium chloride, NaCl, a chemical compound belonging to the larger class of salts. Salt in the form of a natural crystalline mineral is known as rock salt or halite. Salt is present in vast quantities in seawater. The open ocean has about 35 grams, 1.2 ounces, of solids per liter of seawater, a salinity of 3.5%. Salt is essential for life in general, and saltiness is one of the basic human tastes. Salt is one of the oldest and most ubiquitous food seasonings, and salting is an important method of food preservation. 
Some of the earliest evidence of salt processing dates to around 6000 BC when people living in the area of present-day Romania boiled spring water to extract salts. A salt works in China dates to approximately the same period. Salt was also prized by the ancient Hebrews, the Greeks, the Romans, the Byzantines, the Hittites, Egyptians, and the Indians. Salt became an important article of trade and was transported by boat across the Mediterranean Sea along specially built salt roads and across the Sahara on camel caravans. The scarcity and universal need for salt have led nations to go to war over it and use it to raise tax revenues. Salt is used in religious ceremonies and has other cultural and traditional significance. Salt is processed from salt mines and by the evaporation of seawater, sea salt and mineral-rich spring water in shallow pools. Its major industrial products are caustic soda and chlorine. Salt is used in many industrial processes, including the manufacture of polyvinyl chloride, plastics, paper pulp, and many other products of the annual global production of around 200 million tons of salt. About 6% is used for human consumption. Other uses include water conditioning processes, de-icing highways, and agricultural use. Edible salt is sold in forms such as sea salt and table salt, which usually contains an anti-caking agent and may be iodized to prevent iodine deficiency or iodine deficiency, as well as its use in cooking and at the table. Salt is present in many processed foods. Sodium is an essential nutrient for human health via its role as an electrolyte and osmotic solute. Excessive salt consumption may increase the risk of cardiovascular diseases such as hypertension in children and adults. Such health effects of salt have long been studied. Accordingly, numerous World Health Associations and experts in developed countries recommend reducing consumption of popular salty foods. The World Health Organization rep recommends that adults consume less than 2,000 milligrams of sodium, equivalent to 5 grams of salt per day. So we're going to kind of examine the salt as something as essential to everyday life. And it seems to be that it's used widely across many different cultures, especially when we look at the third bullet point here. We see that it's been used by the Hebrews, which is essential for the Bible, as well as the Egyptians and the Hittites that were mentioned as well. And as far as trade is concerned, it seems like it was a high ticketed item and it led into some conflicts, some wars, and it looks like it raised the tax revenue. So it has some political significance as well. And as I was reading, I was thinking about how salt can be used in chlorine and that's essential to what we enjoy sometimes on the beach. So that's good for disinfecting and cleaning. So salt is not just about maybe the taste only, but it's about our cleanliness as well. And so that's essential for us to understand what he really means for us here. Not only the taste, but the cleanliness of who we are, how we taste and how we act accordingly. And I think this is essential to understanding the ethic code that was discussed earlier. So now I'm gonna give you the time to kind of read over this for yourself. If you haven't already paused the talk at all and kind of get your own, I guess, understanding or interpretation of the text as well. So I'm going to give you that time to ponder and reflect on what has been read here and kind of get your own interpretation. And the time starts right now.
now we're going to go over rock salt. And so, adding to the salt description and definition and overview, we're going to look at rock salt, which is so light. And so, we're going to look at what that means for us now and understanding what that is in coherence with just generic salt. And so, I'm about to read it. Of course, you have the option to pause the talk at any point in time as well as waiting to the end to have time to read it for yourself and reflect and get your own interpretation of it again once more you have the option to pause the talk at any point in time and or you can wait until the end to read it and get your own understanding of it and your own interpretation as well from the reading i'm going to start reading about rock salt halite and it reads as follows halite commonly known as rock salt, is a type of salt, the mineral, natural form of sodium chloride, NaCl. Halite forms isometric crystals. The mineral is typically colorless or white, but may also be light blue, dark blue, purple, pink, red, orange, yellow, or gray depending on inclusion of other minerals, impurities, and structural or isotopic abnormalities in the crystals. It commonly occurs with other evaporite deposit minerals such as several of the sulfates, halides, and borates. The name halite is derived from the ancient Greek word for salt, halls. Salt is used extensively in cooking as a flavor enhancer and to cure a wide variety of foods such as bacon, and fish. It is frequently used in food preservation methods across various cultures. Larger pieces can be ground in a salt mill or dusted over food from a shaker as finishing salt. Halite is also often used both residentially and municipally for managing ice because brine, a solution of water and salt, has a low freezing point than pure water. Putting salt or salt water on ice that is below 0 degrees Celsius 30 degrees Fahrenheit will cause it to melt. This effect is called freezing point depression. It is common for homeowners in cold climates to spread salt on their sidewalks and driveways after a snowstorm to melt the ice. It is not necessarily or not necessary to use so much salt that the ice is completely melted. Rather, a small amount of salt will weaken the ice so that it can be easily removed by other means. Also, many cities will spread a mixture of sand and salt on roads during and after a snowstorm to improve traction. Using salt brine is more effective than spreading dry salt because moisture is necessary for the freezing point depression to work and wet salt sticks to the roads better. Otherwise, the salt can be wiped away by traffic. In addition to de-icing, rock salt is occasionally used in agriculture. An example of this would be inducing salt stress to suppress the growth of an annual meadow grass in turf production. Other examples involve exposing weeds to, sea to salt water to dehydrate and kill them, preventing them from affecting other plants. Salt is also used as a household cleaning product. Its coarse nat nature allows for its use in various cleaning scenarios, including grease oil removal, stain removal, dries out and hardens sticky spills for an easier clean. Some cultures, especially in Africa and Brazil, prefer a wide variety of different rock salts for different dishes. Pure salt is avoided as particular colors of salt indicates the presence of different impurities. Many recipes call for particular kinds of rock salt, and imported pure salt often has impurities added to adapt to local taste. Historically, salt was used as a form of currency in barter systems and was exclusively controlled by authorities and their appointees. In some ancient civilizations, the practice of salting the earth 
was done to make conquered land of an enemy infertile and inhospitable as an act of domination or spite. One biblical reference to this practice is in Judges 9.45. He killed the people in it, pulled the wall down, and sold the site with salt. And so now we have polyhylite, a mineral fertilizer, is not a, or not an, sodium chloride polymer, but hydrated potassium to, or potassium calcium manganese sulfate, and it has shotgun shells containing rock salt instead of metal pellets, are a less lethal deterrent. And so going back to the examples that were set, uh, especially with the cleaning agents, we can go back to the chlorine example that was found in the earlier slide. And excuse me for not speaking and reading as clearly as I would like, because the adversary is after me at this point in time. Plus, I probably need a little water to drink. But also, I wanted to point out that it was used as a cleaning agent. And so that goes back to the chlorine, and it goes back to how that's about our conduct with the salt. And as well, it talks about the way that it was used as a currency and also how it was used to conquer lands. And so I think about how chlorine is used in certain clean agents, probably in bleach. And so we can think about certain things in our pop culture or in anime or something like that. The concepts that are in these shows and how that aligns with what's known about the element of salt. Not just salt by itself, but separating the two, sodium and chloride, and how it's utilized in not only nature, but in our household uses. So I think about song titles as well. We have the song Chlorine by 21 Pilots, as well as you have other songs that mention bleach in them in the Christian hip-hop genre that was highly, highly, uh, I guess controversial, was uh, Show Baraka's song, Jim Crow. And even the original title was also controversial. So I want you to kind of read it over yourself and kind of get your own interpretation of all of this collectively and going back to Matthew 5, 1 through 22 and kind of adding that to your understanding. And that time really starts now. Now I have a picture of a piece of salt. It's a nice crystal block. It's actually rock salt here. Uh, it's a light from the Willa Kizaka salt mine. It's spelled W I E L I C Z K A. Willisica. Is it Willisica? Salt mine. Uh, Malopoliski, Poland. And so, this is a piece of rock salt. It has a bunch of different crystals on it. And so, I wanted you to kind of ponder on this. I'm going to give you some time to kind of look at it. Just wanted to give you the caption here for this picture. And I'm going to just let you look at it for however long you need to. Of course, you can pause to talk to as well.
Now we're going to discuss light and lasers. I'm going to begin to start with light on your left hand side and then we'll go into lasers on your right hand side and then we'll discuss the different uses of primarily lasers later on and you have the options to pause the talk at any point in time and or you can wait until the end to read about both descriptions of light and lasers. Again you have the option to pause the talk at any point in time and or you can wait until the end to read the descriptions for yourself and get an interpretation. I'm about to begin to read about lights first and then we'll go into lasers second. And so let's read it. And it reads as follows. Light or visible light is electromagnetic radiation within the portion of the electromagnetic spectrum that is perceived by the human eye. Visible light is usually defined as having wavelengths in the range of 400 to 700 nanometers nm corresponding to frequencies of 750 to 420 terahertz between the infrared with longer wavelengths and the ultraviolet with shorter wavelengths. In physics, the term light may refer more broadly to electromagnetic radiation of any wavelength, whether visible or not. In this sense, gamma rays, x-rays, microwaves, and radio waves are also light. The primary properties of light are intensity, propagation direction, frequency or wavelength spectrum, and polarization. Its speed in a vacuum, 299,792,458 meters a second, or meters per second, m s is one of the fundamental constants of nature. Like all types of electromagnetic radiation, visible light propagates by massless elementary particles called photons that represent the quanta of electromagnetic field and it can be analyzed as both waves and particles. The study of light known as optics is an important research area in modern physics. The main source of natural light on Earth is the sun. Historically, another important source of light for humans has been fire. From ancient campfires to modern kerosene lamps, with the development of electric lights and power systems, electric lighting has effectively replaced firelight. And I'm going to read the let's see the last part from the second bullet of light and go on down again. Like all types of electromagnetic radiation, visible light propagates by massless elementary particles called photons that represents the quanta of electromagnetic field and can be analyzed as both waves and particles. The study of light known as optics is an important research area in modern physics. The last bullet. The main source of natural light on Earth is the sun. Historically, another important source of light for humans has been fire, from ancient campfires to modern kerosene lamps, with the development of electric lights and power systems. Electric lighting has effectively replaced firelight. And so now we're going to move on to lasers. A laser is a device that emits light through a process of optical amplification based on the stimulated emission of electromagnetic radiation. The word laser is an acronym for light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation. The first laser was built in 1960 by Theodore H. Maiman at Hughes Research Laboratories. Based on theoretical work by Charles Hart Towns and author Leonard Scalo, a laser differs from other sources of light in that it emits light which is coherent. Spatial coherence allows a laser to be focused to a tight spot, enabling applications such as laser cutting and lithography. Spatial coherence also allows a laser beam to stay narrow over great distances. Collimation, enabling 
applications such as laser pointers and LIDAR. Light detection and ranging. Lasers can also have high temporal coherence, which allows them to emit light with a very narrow spectrum. Alternatively, temporal coherence can be used to produce ultra-short pulses of light with a broad spectrum, but durations as short as a femtosecond. Lasers are used in optical disk drives, laser printers, barcode scanners, DNA sequencing instruments, fiber optic, and free space, or free space optical communication, semiconducting chip manufacturing, phytolithography, or phytolithography, phytolithography, laser surgery, and skin treatments, cutting and welding materials, military and law enforcement devices for marking targets and measuring range and speed, and in laser lighting displays for entertainment. Semiconductor lasers in the blue to near UV have also been used in place of light emitting diodes, LEDs, to excite fluorescence as a white light source. This permits a much smaller emitting area due to the much greater radiance of a laser and avoids the droop suffered by LEDs. Such devices are already used in some car headlamps. So I'm going to go over that last bullet one more time as far as the usages because that's significant to what we're about to discuss next. Lasers are used in optical disk drives, laser printers, barcode scanners, DNA sequencing instruments, fiber optic and free space optical uh, optical communication, excuse me. Semiconducting chip manufacturing, photolithography, laser surgery and skin treatments, cutting and welding materials, military and law enforcement devices for marking targets and measuring range and speed, and in laser lighting displays for entertainment, semiconductor lasers in the blue to near UV have also been used in place of light emitting diodes. LEDs to excite fluorescence as a white light source. This permits a much smaller emitting area due to the much greater radiance of a laser and avoids the droop suffered by LEDs. Such devices are already used in some car headlamps. So moving forward, we'll discuss certain areas in which the actual laser is used in application. So we're going to discuss that next. So there's a wide range of applications that lasers can be used for. And so I went ahead and went to the internet and found some ways that lasers can be used amongst communications, industry, military, law enforcement, commercial products and entertainment and so we discussed some of that a little bit as well and there's some done in research as well if I skipped over that one uh, specifically looking at communications they have the fiber optic communications and the free spatial optical communication including laser communication in space so that's basically with our satellites and so we discussed already the fiber optic communication as well as the free space optical communication as well and in this industry, you use it for cutting and converting thin materials and welding, heat treatments, marking parts, engraving and bonding, additive manufacturing or 3D printing processes such as selective laser sensoring and selective laser melting. And so there's also some military applications. And they got marking targets and guiding munitions, uh, missile defense, electro-optical countermeasures, EOCM and the LIDAR we discussed as well, blinding troops, firearm sites, and so they did some law enforcement for the LIDAR traffic enforcement which we discussed as well and we did, they did some stuff on some fingerprints and forensic identifications. So for the research side, it's, it seems to be that some of the stuff that you might see already 
if you're doing research in a lab, you've probably heard of some of this. Spectroscopy, laser ablation, laser annealing, laser scattering, laser interferometry. Oh, what is that? Laser interferometry. Excuse me. Interferometry. I've never heard of that one before. Laser capture micro dissection, fluorescent microscopy, meteorology, and then laser cooling. The laser, what is it? The laser interferometry. Interferometry? Interferometry. Interferometry. Interferometry, right? Laser interferometry. That sounds interesting. I've never really heard of that one before. I wonder what they use that one for. The laser interferometry. Interferometry. Interferometry? I wonder if, if that's used for anything significant anyway. The laser interferometry. Hmm. Moving on, we have the commercial products. Laser printers, uh, barcode scanners, thermometers, laser pointers, and holograms, and bubble grams. And in entertainment, they got the optical disc, laser lighting displays, and then laser turntables. And so they have a pricing of how much uh, diodes they used in 2004. And then they said it costs like $2.19 million. The lasers were sold for that value. In the same year, the... Approximately 733 million diode lasers valued at 3.2 billion sold. So that was the first one was excluding the diode lasers, and then this is the diode sales by themselves at the end. So that's a lot of money being spent towards diode lasers. Specifically in 2004. But I'm still curious about the laser interferometry. Oh, there it is. Laser interferometry. I think it is. Laser interferometry. I'm interested in understanding what that is used for. Because spectroscopy is probably used to look and examine materials. Laser ablation seems to be damaged, I think. Laser annealing. I mean, you're restructuring the material there, I assume. When you anneal something, you reheat it to restructure the microstructure, I think I've read before. So they use the laser to heat it up. But the laser interferometry, I believe, interferometry, I wonder what that's used for. I kind of want to know if you wanted to go back. I actually might put this in the comment section. The listing of the different applications of the lasers. Um, so you can view that for yourself. And or I might be able to actually put that in somewhere. Um, if you contact me as well so that you can get a nice listing of this also you can go to wikipedia and they have a good listing of some of this information as well and any other site about lasers I, i'm pretty sure there's a bunch of papers that you can look up on google scholar about the different research that they're doing for different applications for lasers as well oh by the way i didn't give you your time to review the light and lasers part I mean, you possibly have done that already if you pause the talk. But if you still want time to do that, you can go ahead now. And or you can kind of scroll back a little bit with the buffer here and kind of listen to me ramble about the different uses of the laser as well. So I'm going to give you that time now.
In continuation with light and lasers, I have a photograph of three different items. So we have light veering through a cave, so it's a beam of sunlight specifically, inside the cavity of Raka Iliabesu at Fanolici in Fontina, Sicily. So that's the light beaming through a cave at Fanolici, Fanolici, Fontina, Sicily. Might as well say this right. Fonda Chili. Fonticelli, excuse me. Fonticelli, Fontina, Sicily. I gotta say that right. Fonticelli, Fonticelli, excuse me. Fonticelli, Fontina, Sicily. Fonticelli, Fontina, Sicily. I gotta say that right on the money. That's a beam of sunlight inside of the cavity or in the cave right there. And uh, then we've got lasers range in size from microscopic dialer lasers at the top there with numerous applications to football size neodymium glass lasers at the bottom used for inertial confinement fusion nuclear weapons research and add other high energy density physics experiments wow that sounds like a mouthful and that's basically a caption of the picture to your far right there. So we're seeing that from light shining into a cave to making energy and creating weaponry, light is essential to see what we believe. So we're capable of seeing what we believe. Going down to the photon is what it says. It's duality has two parts to it. It's a particle and a wave. So it's actually able to have this duality and it's essential to making great innovations and advancement in technology. And plus it helps us to see what we believe literally. Like we can see what's in front of us. This computer screen that I'm operating from the keyboard, uh, the lamp that's on the table is helping me actually see that as well. The lights inside the computer help light up the display. Television as well as we watch our different sports and television shows, sitcoms, and news. It's created a way for us to communicate as well with the telecommunications as presented to us earlier. Light is essential with salt it's capable of doing great and beautiful things and we understand that since the salt is a crystal and if light can beam through it what can we create from that hmm i'm hoping that you enjoyed this though this whole entire talk we're hoping to go into the summary and just summarize what we have learned so far about this chapter alone with these examples about salt and light as a metaphor what we can actually achieve as a society how can we have that attitude to live amongst man and be our best for God being good to not only just man but to God as well so we're hoping to understand what salt brings to the table and what light brings into the life of each and every human being so I'm gonna give you a chance to kind of examine these photos here a little bit just a little time because I'm pretty sure you've looked at them enough You've heard me ramble about this. So, I'm going to give you that time, and it starts now.
In summary, the Sermon on the Mount is a way to build faith and character. By knowing the structure of the Sermon on the Mount, it can help us encourage other believers from falling into the trap of discontentment. It will fortify the mind of the individuals to have the proper conduct in the challenges of faith and profession. The salt as a mineral is essential to the foundation of what is known about daily life. Not only is this about the foods that are eaten, it is about the way words are said. It is about how the earth was created. It further extenuates the idea that our faith is not bland and boring. It is full of life and excitement, mainly with good food, good drinks, and good conversation. Lastly, the light that shines does display the good works that are done among men. It is essential that light signifies as a metaphor of the knowledge gained in life. It is seen as heat that keeps the faith hot, not just as a flame of fire, but as a light beam. It seems that even in the science fiction genre, light resembles something to be obtained as a positive, even in terms of weaponry and defense. Ephesians 6, 17 and Hebrews 4, 12, knowing that it can bring forth the knowledge of who Jesus Christ is and who his Father is. James 1, 17 through 20, once more. And so, we discuss salt not only in the terms of food and in not making our life bland and boring, but making it exciting, but we also talked about how salt was used as a cleaning agent. So we can look at the way that we conduct ourselves in that light in a clean fashion. And so people want to kind of refine us so quickly to the point that it seems that we're not ready to show forth that good conduct. We have to continually go through the cleansing process. And so we look at the salinity of natural salt water how that's, you know, only 3.5%. And I look at, potentially, where Jesus was baptized in the Jordan River. We have to ask ourselves, is the Jordan River salty? Or is it just clear water? We also have to look at what light also represents for us, not just in science fiction, but in real science. And so in the terms of real weaponry and defense, how that has affected our daily life as well. And so light is not just a way of saying that there is knowledge only, but it seems like this is about energy. This is about communicating one to another, being brotherly. It's about our gift to the world, not necessarily depleting the world of a gift. Maybe you just are a person with a good heart. Maybe you're a person of good joy and cheer. Maybe somebody has the light to bring forth music and entertainment because we've seen that. We have light that is used for those purposes. And so we want to make sure that we're able to fall in line with the purpose that God has given us. And we want to make sure that it's done properly and in a proper manner. And we want to make sure that we conduct ourselves in a proper manner. And it goes with the fact that we are renewing ourselves, renewing our minds daily. We don't just renew our minds and we stop and become stagnant. But we keep moving forward. We keep beaming. We keep moving. We have that duality. It's a wave. One time we're up, one time we're down, but we have to continually accelerate and make sure, or I guess move forward since it's a constant speed. We have to move forward and make sure that we can, you know, move in light speed and make our destination known to the rest of the world. And so if you're new to all of this information, this is cool then. Because it's an opportunity for you to learn something. If I didn't say all of this correctly, if I said it kind of jumbled, I excuse me for that. I am really probably on gears and I'm kind of excited at the same time nervous about presenting this material to you. If you're new to it, again, uh, this is a great opportunity for you to receive salvation and know who Jesus is. And that's generally through prayer. And I want to make sure that you 
have that opportunity to communicate so forth light uh, through this prayer by confessing that you need him and it's through a prayer as simple as this it goes like this if you can repeat after me it says Lord Jesus come into my heart I acknowledge I'm a sinner I believe that you are the Son of God I believe that you died but you did not stay dead you rose on the third day with power and ascended to the right hand of the Father where you are making intercessions for us cleanse me renew me refresh me and make me whole again it is all of this and more we pray in your son your messenger Jesus Christ's name amen now if you pray this simple prayer you are saved this is not a church I would advise you join a local congregation a Bible teaching church sound in Holy Scripture support them and make sure you get involved in that ministry whether you are in attendance you are part of different teams and our music ministries there also when you get a chance pay tithes and offering there if you would like to make donations to this channel you can contact me with the email provided below now, I welcome you to the family of God through Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior now if you're not new to this information don't feel bad just be happy that you got a review of information um, I'm just happy that you came by to see this and view this to see what I'm talking about even if you just were I don't know nosy or just curious whatever and you know what I'm just you know I'm not really mad at people that are kind of nosy it's okay because hey we have curiosity but this curiosity will not kill you it will give you life so I'm not mad at you being nosy and curious about this information right here I just thank you for coming by hope that you can come by next time we're gonna start uh, a new book so I'm kind of excited about that thanks so much I hope that you got so much out of it as much as I had making it until next time peace and God bless Thank you for watching. Subscribe, comment, contact, ask questions. If you have anything pertaining to this topic, Matthew 5, 1-22, being content in the kingdom of God, the right to be in a good attitude, you can leave a comment and or contact me at the email address below. If you have any resources through books, websites, encyclopedias, textbooks, atlases, etc., you can provide those resources through email and the comment section. I'm a student of the Word and a student of life, so anything pertaining to the Holy Bible, Christianity, the early church, Jesus Christ, the church today, and other topics surrounding these would be beneficial. Especially when we talked about salt and rock salt, its different applications as a cleaning agent, the different nations that used it, including the Hebrews, the Greeks, the Indians, the Hittites, the Egyptians, uh, the list goes on, and I didn't put it in the particular order that was given in the details, but that information would be vital in what they used it for the different ceremonies and cultural significances that it had for it, as well as what it actually meant as an economic good, how it started wars amongst the different nations, and as its usage as a currency in bartering. That would be very interesting to know if you have information on that. Also, the usage of light and lasers and understanding photons and the different specifics of light as we go into it. It seems that it can go into further with the subatomic particles that they talk about in modern physics as well as some other spurring topic, topics that, you know, can be tangents. But how can we lead that back into the church and how does that affect the meaning of what we just learned in Matthew 5, 1 through 22? And what does that mean for the believer and understanding who God is as not only a loving God, but creator God, since in the beginning, he created light out of the darkness. So that's one of the major things we saw in creation. If you read the book, 
light is essential to creation as well as salt as we have understood based on this talk if you have any information that is vital to this i would greatly appreciate that totally man if you like to donate to this channel you can also email me where i can provide the tags to get those donations and provide the vision that i have for this channel and more the process for this vision is imperative so there is also room for critique as these donations are given uh, if you have issues with the way that i was speaking throughout the presentation it seemed like the adversary was out to get me with my tongue and or a cat got my tongue uh, you have something going on with the color scheme, have something going on with the way that I design the presentation, the talk, based on how much content, lack of content, uh, not specifically touching on certain issues, not breaking it apart enough and going into the details enough for you to grasp something out of it. If you have any of those critiques, whether you give a donation or not you can please do that in the comment section and as well as you contact me with that critique with and or without the donation that would be greatly appreciated as well come again next time where we will discuss Esther chapter 1 it will be a great lesson for us to endeavor into Esther so Let's get ready for that. Also, I'm gathering information for the next books we will be going through. They're going to be Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Jonah, and Micah. With these lessons, there will be no complete chronological order. And I hope that you can stay tuned for that. Thank you for watching again. Peace and God bless. I'm ringing out.